about how much like us they think um, when we do this. So a couple of them are um, uh, word clouds. So, so the bigger the word, obviously, the more people are putting in. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and I think it will be revealing. It usually is. Uh, but <clears throat> before we do that, let me, uh, let me pray to get us started. Father, thanks for this day. Thanks for your love for us. Um, certainly for your grace. Uh, uh, you know, I, um, I confess that a lot of times I don't see it very often because I'm not looking and uh, uh, how lavish it is. And I pray that you'll guide us into <clears throat> a clear understanding of what grace looks like in our everyday lives, not only with ourselves, but with uh, each other. Uh, and also just where we are as far as shame and how uh, corrosive it is and how much it steals um, from us and the life that we can live in, in the grace you offer us. So grant us the wisdom and the perseverance to hang with this process and, and to continue to wrestle with it. Um, help us to, to lean on you enough to prevent some of the shame that probably is lurking at our door even as we start to talk about this and, and be able to identify it for what it is. So thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Okay, so as I am prone to say, let's define our terms. And uh, the very first one, um, and l let me give you the parameters for the poll, okay? So you're going to use your phone. If you've got your phone, get it up. <clears throat> um, the, the number you're going to enter uh, to send the message to is 37607. 37607. And um, the message is going to be DR Mitch. All lowercase, all one word. So D-R-M-I-T-S-C-H. And you should get a confirmation that you're in the poll. Okay, we got everybody in? Not entirely. <clears throat> I'll wait. You're all teed up for it, aren't you, Sal? Mm -hmm. yep. <clears throat> Except this one's going to be different than the one you saw yesterday. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, this, this has a limit. Right. In other words, it takes 25 responses because I'm too cheap to buy the other package. Um, so grunt, root, and growl, as my father-in-law used to say, go after it um, and get your response in. So um, everybody on? Okay. Here's the first, first question. <clears throat> Please complete this sentence. Never blank enough. Insert it into that statement. What would you put in that blank? <clears throat> Pardon me? One response or more? Uh, but if you want to get one more of those 25 and steal it from somebody else, you can, I guess. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, it can be one response or more. It'll, it'll tap out, and then, then you won't be able to enter anymore. <clears throat> Okay, now this is this is for you uh, and and your powers of observation. What jumps out at you in in that in that uh, word cloud as you're looking at it? <clears throat> Obviously, you know what you put in, but <clears throat> anything strike you? <clears throat> the word anything. Because when I saw it, I was like, oh, I wish I, there was something that was like all encompassing, and then somebody put anything in. Never anything enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Feel. Pardon me? Feel. Never feel enough? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I think, I think in some respects, if I give this in, in a university or a educational setting, that the, the second biggest one there, smart enough, is, is probably going to be a front runner, no matter what you do. The irony is, is how global good is, is good enough. <clears throat> um, the, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this in a minute. I just want to give you food for thought here. All right, here's the next one. <clears throat> what do you think when you hear the word grace? <clears throat> what word or words do you think of? Okay, so uh, um, as as we're doing these things, absorb them. Okay, because this is this is what you guys in this class are are um, thinking about grace, forgiveness, and undeserving <clears throat> God, which is comforting. Uh, Christian University, um, <clears throat> um, undeserved, endless, etc. Um, <clears throat> here's another one. What do you think of when you hear the word shame? Heaven, heavy, hidden, guilt. Anybody know when when um, shame was first first appears in the Bible? Anybody know? For me? When I realize they don't have clothes on. <clears throat> That's where most people go. <clears throat> but actually, it's a little earlier than that. Because when, when they were created, and, and it says they were without shame before. And then when they did, he said, she said, you, after all. <laughs> then we are land at, and they were ashamed. And we've been ashamed ever since. What did they do in response to shame? Hide. We've been hiding ever since. <clears throat> so, the the again the, this I, I do this exercise just to give you an idea, because when you were doing inter introductions on Tuesday, you didn't mention this stuff. Okay, now you may have been mentioning this stuff to yourself after you left um, about what you could have or should have done or should have said or etc. But. <clears throat> The, the, the realities of grace and shame and how they play out in our lives, the one is far so pervasive we simply don't see it. I had somebody in the other class say, so how pervasive is it? I, did I say this to you guys? And I said, I said to them, think of fish and water. I, the, the fish don't know that they're surrounded by water. <clears throat> so what... what uh, what I want to look at is this, and, and this, is, this is a quote that isn't even about shame, 
But our topic today is why am I never enough? And more often than not, I think probably to a person uh, in a class like this or the other class or any of the classes I've done, to a person, we have in exasperation asked that question. And so um, Lynn Twist wrote a book called The Soul of Money. And I thought this was very revealing in terms of, of the quote. It says, whether true or not, that thought of not enough occurs to us automatically before we even think to question or examine it. We spend most of the hours and days of our lives hearing, explaining, complaining, or worrying about what we don't have enough of. My challenge to you is watch the rest of your day and see if this isn't true. She's talking about the soul of money. She's not even talking about the, the nature of what we do with ourselves. <clears throat> so, the, 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 the issue that I want to poke at here when we're talking about it is why am I never enough? The issue is one of scarcity versus abundance. Now, before we get into that, let, let me just all right, stake the flag here with this slide and go on a little rant. <laughs> because enough by definition is a comparison word. By definition, it is a comparison word. Compared to what? And enough implies that if I get enough, I'll be okay. The dirty little secret is it's not about enough at all. I, I had an interesting interaction with an author that I invited to, to come, and I, I wanted to interview her for my podcast. And she, she wrote a book, um, This Too Shall Last. It's about grace and suffering. K.J. Ramsey. And so there was one point on the, pod, on the interview f between her and I that we really wrangled. Not wrangled, but I mean, we, we just, I didn't agree with her. I, and all you have to do is see my notes in, in the book. <laughs> it's like, I, I, I took extra pages just to write about it. Because she said, her assertion was that the good news, literally, and this is a quote from her, the good news is we aren't enough. <laughs> and and my, my assertion back to her is it's not about enough. So if somebody asks you, you know, <laughs> why are you beating your mother? I don't know if you do or not, but whatever. And you assume that the truth of the question is such that you start defending yourself, you've already affirmed the question, right? The same thing happens with the enough statement, is that <clears throat> we assume that the present premise of that assertion is true, Rather than saying, you know what, it's not even about enough, because enough is still a comparison term. It's, it's still a comparison term. So it's not really about that at all. And we get distracted by it because that's the nature of everything that we do. And, and the, the, you know, each of us has the heart of a Pharisee. Each of us does. Because we want to compare how far we've gone compared to somebody else. And if we're farther along than them, we're doing okay. We may not say we're better than them, but we're doing okay. We, and, and so we always have to, to look at the nature of enough implies that there is this scarce resource called approval, affirmation, whatever it might be, love. And that's a very scarce commodity, and I need to get enough of it for me to be able to exist and be important and, and have, have, have uh, uh, the approval that I need or whatever. And the challenge is, is how do I embrace or how do I live in a life of abundance? We know for a fact, I think we all know, that Jesus said, I came to give you life and life abundantly. So we live lives of, lives of scarcity, and we wonder why we're not living abundantly. Because we're, we're chained to this phrase, enough. Um, and it's, it, you know, I, I, I get 
my motor gets running pretty fast about this because of how often I have talked about it over 40 years of time talking to people. And inevitably, paths lead back to this thing. So either the comparison to other people, either to what I should be, which is the ideal self, and, <clears throat> and I, I don't know if it was in this class or the other class that I, I said should is the evil twin of shame. I call it worse, but yeah, what's new? Um, so my ideal self is the should. If you come into, into my office and look, and probably the first thing you might notice as you walk into my office is a little plaque that a student made for me. And it's a quote from a friend of mine that said, God loves you as you not are, not as you should be, because you're never going to be what you should be. Should is chaining me to this. What I am chains me to the identity that I've been given. So my ideal self, my past. I mean, look back at the look back at what was triggered when I said what words come to mind when I, I when we say shame, and there was one of them on there, right? That one, that one. The voice of shame is oftentimes the 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 past chirping at us about what will never be or never be enough of or shouldn't be or whatever. And then the, the, the thing to keep in mind is with all of these, these are all floating standards. As f when I get close, it just floats higher. And, and Brene Brown often says, you know, that if shame, shame's driving the car, uh, perfectionism is in the back seat. And, and so there's a floating standard, and that's, that's the tyranny of the perfectionists is that it's always, you never stop to celebrate, because if you do, you're settling for mediocrity, and, <clears throat> and uh, it, it always is floating upwards. So the, the, scores, the source of our scarcity, it thrives in shame-prone cultures. And when I say both internal and external, it's easy for us to pay attention to the external, okay? Like, like social media, but the irony is, is how badly we have bastardized the, the message of grace into a world of shoulds and shame. And so instead of freedom, we're, we're enslaved and call it freedom. <clears throat> and so we, we li live in our own little prison cells that we have counted each block and know what, where each one is. And it becomes so comfortable that when somebody says, you're free and you have the key, it's like, no, I'll stay here for a while, thanks. Because I know it, it's predictable, I can control it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in a lot of cases, the church, not universal, but in a lot of cases, the church is, is, is the worst place and it's not because that's what the pastor is preaching about. It's what the people are thinking about. And so the stuff, the pastor can be the clearest order about grace and everything else. And what is getting heard is all the things that they should be or could be or what they haven't done or whatever. Because this internal culture is, is marinating in shame. It's, it's repeating itself over and over and over again. Now, obviously, I don't need to say probably a whole lot about social media. Social media lives on comparison. It lives on comparison. Why, does it, why do we get such a rush about it? Because it fits right in with our, our upbringing and our internal culture of shame anyway. And so I compare my real life with somebody else's highlight reel and, and conclude that I'm a loser. <laughs> And, and that alone is, is the most prominent statement of shame around ever. Because remember, shame is about your person. Guilt is about your, your performance. It's about your behavior, the things that you choose to do. So when we start making conclusions about who we are, shame is probably driving the car on that one. The other thing that, that I have to say something about is how we translate bi biblical standards. Because in a lot of cases, the way, that we, the way that we motivate ourselves to live by biblical standards is by shame. 
So somewhere along the way, the biblical standard becomes a bludgeon, not a tool of freedom. And, and I say that, <clears throat> the, you know, the reason that I, I say fish and water and all those kinds of metaphors about shame is because, quite honestly, I think, quite honestly, I think we doubt grace's power. I don't think we think it's powerful at all. And so shame, on the other hand, since we use that to motivate ourselves, Shame is the thing that produces the greatest behavior change quickly. Now, I didn't say behavior change over time, but quickly. And, and so what do we do? I'm going to change my behavior to avoid feeling so bad. Instead of, I'm going to change my behavior because it affects other people and, and this is not what I want to do, and et cetera, et cetera. See, we end up, we end up defining things in terms of what we don't want rather than moving toward the things we do want. And, and the, the reality of, of grace is, is that it creates a space for us to change. Shame enslaves us and punishes us never changing, which obviously is an overstatement, but shame has its, its power in, in the condemnation factor. So the, the, the response that we need for, to, to scarcity is what Brene Brown refers to, and some of this will probably sound a little familiar since you started some of your reading, is the idea of wholeheartedness. Wholeheartedness um, is, is referred to in, in the Bible. David was referred to or described as um, not only you know, a man after God's own heart, but he was also wholehearted. Another word for that would be a man of integrity. Sometimes some translations actually um, uh, translate it that way. Because integrity is being whole. And so scarcity tempts us into the competition for what we assume to be uh, diminishing resources. And, and defining ourselves in terms of things that, that are diminishing. So, oftentimes we end up buying, our, buying into the notion that acceptance is dependent on other people rather than the, the theological things we, we say we believe, and that is my identity is in Christ and he has made me you know, complete, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's, that is the, far and away. The thing, the thing that I notice is that shame tempts us into splitting ourselves. And so we split ourselves into what will appear one way, and then I live another way. And, and really the reality is, is my behavior betrays what I believe <clears throat> rather than what I espouse. Now, you could say, well, you, I, I espouse something as an aspirational thing. Well, okay, that's fine. You can say that. But if I, if, I watch what, if I watch how I react and how I interact with people and listen to the things that I say or I hear other people say, before too long, I will notice that everywhere. The comparison is always there. It's lurking in the background. It's always there. And our conclusion is always the same. Well, I, I just can't do it good enough. I, I, I'm just not going to be good enough. And, and I, you know, I can tell you, having sat with a lot of couples in marriage counseling and everything else, I can't tell you how many spouses have said, I can't do it good enough for her or him. And it's a target that I don't know. And, and the frustration starts to build because I'm trying to hit a target that is hidden from me, and yet I'm still being judged by it. Which, ironically, is exactly what we do with ourselves. Is we just keep moving the target and then condemn ourselves for missing it. So the, the idea of wholeheartedness is important. There is a variety of supporting mythology that goes with this split between scarcity and abundance and, and being wholehearted people. 
Um, and and the, the first of the um, mythologies is this, is vulnerability is weakness. Now, if you'll notice, as we were talking last time, and y'all were introducing yourselves and, and warming to, well, maybe not warming, but, but hearing about the idea of the groups, uniformly, you know, on Monday and Tuesday, as I had classes, and, and particularly ones that have groups in it, uniformly, that issue of vulnerability came up over and over and over again, consistently. I think everybody's feeling it. Now, it's not like you're, somebody's going to hold a gun to your head to be vulnerable. What good is that? But if, if I see vulnerability as weakness, then it informs all of the emotions. As a matter of fact, it stuffs all the emotions because my emotions are the things that create uncertainty, they create risk, they, they create this possibility of exposure, they create all of those things. Why is it, why is it, and you guys that are in my, have been in my grief and loss class will probably know what I'm going to say. But why is it do we apologize for our tears? And I'll let you answer it for yourself. Mm, like trying to judge others and see if they're uncomfortable. Yeah, well, we yeah, we already do the judgment, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm making somebody else uncomfortable. Yeah. And so now I preemptively apologize for that. And so, spoiler alert for the grief and loss class, the thing that I say in there on a regular basis is I refuse to apologize for my tears. If you're uncomfortable, sucks to be you. I'm just going to figure out a way how I can own myself. And then you can join the party if you want to. <clears throat> but if we, if we see feeling as a failure or emotions as liabilities, and maybe we've grown up in families like that, or we cultivate the same internal culture like that, and, and then um, what do tears do? They out us. They literally out us. And now I'm apologizing because I don't want somebody to make more of it than it, than than it is, and it is something more because that's exactly why they're tumbling out of our eyes. <clears throat> and so, as Brown, uh, Brene Brown says, sound, it sound, if it sounds like truth, then it feels like courage. And again, let's be clear about our definitions of courage. Courage, I am not talking about heroism. I'm talking about, as she indicates in her book, the true definition of courage, and that's speaking all of one's heart. C-O-U-R, in the French, C-O-U-E-R, cour, is heart. And so when I encourage, a lot of times we think just saying nice things to somebody else, and, and I would re redefine it into encouragement, then, is my heart speaking to another person's heart, because that's what it's supposed to be. Encourages is, is operating from my heart. And it is. I can tell you, having done these groups for enough, a long enough time, the, the, what, what we, would not, we would never label it as courage, but what I have seen is, is remarkable things of courage in the groups that I have led over the years. Remarkable things of courage. And, and people walk away and end up saying, I feel a little, two things, I feel a little lighter, and I feel known. And that takes courage. Because one of the other narratives of that internal culture I was talking about, one of the narratives we carry around with us, is that if you knew me the way I know me, you wouldn't like me either. I'd have, a, I'd have a, a, you know, I would have a, a, a audience that would agree with me. So the, the supporting mythology includes some of this. Um, Brene Brown says, far from being an effective shield, the illusion of invulnerability undermines the very response that would have supplied the kind of protection we need. And the protection isn't from me, okay? The protection is from being known. Um, and and I'll, I, I have a, a commercial that I found 
Many, many years ago when I was working with missionaries, there was a group that I worked with in Ghana, and one of the, the leaders um, told me once about an African proverb that it was very common in, in Ghana. Um, and she said, uh, it goes this way, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And so invulnerability undermines the very connection that we need in order to have the protection that we want. And, and that's, that's a key component, I think, in a lot of ways to understand about um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the challenge, I think, is the word I'm looking for, of, of um, vulnerability. So the crux of the problem is vulnerability is courage in you and inadequacy in me. We, we unequally apply what is, what is beneficial and useful. And for most of us, I'm drawn to vulnerability, but I'm repelled by my own. And, and this will probably display itself. Some of you guys have been in the other groups, so you would probably say, yes, indeed, this does do this. The, the interesting thing about it is, is that when vulnerability is displayed, most people, their hearts open almost instantaneously. And they move toward the other person. They may not, may not move physically toward them, but they move toward them. <clears throat> and, and applaud. Uh, you know, they, it is a courage. We, we kind of innately recognize the courage of that act of being known like that. But when it comes to mine, that's a different story. And when, then we have to fight through all of these obstacles to, to allow ourselves to be known in some way. I, uh, uh, m many years ago, it was relatively early in my career, I was working in a hospital um, with uh, adolescents, and I, I was searching for a way to, to have them portray for me how they protect themselves and their hearts. And so I, for just on a lark, it, you know, the, the group was lagging, and, and you know, they, I, they, it seemed like we weren't getting anywhere. And so I, I, I brought in a, a stack of uh, butcher block paper and some markers if you want to keep adolescents, you just do that. You know, they'll they'll draw just to not listen. And so I, I said to them, um, I said, here here, let's let's talk about this. Why don't you show me what your heart looks like? Draw a picture of it. And there's one particular kid, and and this is you know this is well nigh 30 years ago, and I still remember it very vividly. He was a pretty good artist, and and he, and he drew a heart. And, <clears throat> and it was somewhat three-dimensional, but the heart, it, it looked like, have any of you guys seen the maps of, uh, in the Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth? And it looked like Mordor that had a, a ring of mountains all the way around it, okay? And so he, he created a wall, and, and, you know, it, and he was a good enough artist that you could actually tell. And, and then outside of the wall, there was a moat, and in the moat, there were alligators. And on top of the wall, there was crushed glass. And there were dogs and, and machine guns. And, and as he was explaining it to me, you know, I, and the, this kind of dates the time at which it was occurring. But I said to him, I said, nobody but Indiana Jones can get to your heart. And he said, yeah, exactly. That's the point. And, and ironically... He said to me, <laughs> he said, so I dare you. I said, challenge accepted. <laughs> and and the, the funny thing about it is, is that as, and again, you guys have heard me say this before, people don't need your profundity, they just want your presence. As I persisted in being present with this kid, he took his wall down. I didn't have to because... I offered him something that said, without me ever saying it, said, there's a one place that you can be safe. And that, we have to fight through that, I think. 
And, and what the fight is, is all of these messages that we have incorporated into our, over our lives about who we are, what we are worthy of, and then we enact it in our relationships with other people and, and ultimately even with God. Uh, this, the second myth is I don't do vulnerability. I hear this from guys a lot. <clears throat> I don't do vulnerability. <laughs> And as, as Brown makes it very clear, you may not do vulnerability, but it will do you. <laughs> and it will isolate you. And as Madeline Langle says, when, when we were children, we used to think that when we were grown up, we would no longer be vulnerable. We thought that being strong was not being at risk for being hurt. But to grow up is to accept vulnerability, to be alive is to be vulnerable. To be alive is to be vulnerable. I don't think we think of it that way. But there's a lot of things about our everyday lives that we just kind of sidestep and not really pay attention to at all. I mean, the minute, the minute you get in your car and drive to wherever you're going to get something to eat or home or wherever, you're vulnerable. I think we all know that, right? I mean, we have multi-thousand-pound objects hurtling at each other at 55 miles an hour, passing only within inches of each other, and we think, yeah, this is great. I'm fine. <laughs> the bigger my vehicle, the safer I am. <laughs> and so vulnerability is something that sooner or later will visit us all. And the matter of it is not so much whether it will or not. The matter of it is, is <clears throat> are we going to adopt that as a lifestyle? Now, remember, we've got a lot of mythology, right, around vulnerability. One of, one of them's coming up that I'm sure probably has percolated in a variety of people's minds. And that is, you know, vulnerability means just letting all my laundry hang out everywhere. And that, that is far from that. So vulnerability is letting it all hang out. It's not that at all. That's why we're spending time talking about safe people and boundaries. It's not letting it all hang out. It is exercising enough discernment to know who, is, who has earned the right to hear certain things about us and making the choice about how I am going to reveal that and in what portions I'm going to reveal that. <clears throat> and, and that's the key. You know, I, and I've used the metaphor before and will again in, in boundaries is, is you're, you're the only gatekeeper of your heart. There's nobody else. Nobody gets to tell you what you let in and what you don't let in. So ultimately... In order to get, get trust, we have to be vulnerable. In order to, to, um, uh, to experience vulnerability, we need trusted people. And, and that's, that's part of the landscape. You're not going to get vulnerability without trust, and you're not going to get trust without some measure of vulnerability. Oftentimes, reciprocal vulnerability. It's not just somebody, you know, that I just talk, talk, talk. I mean... The, the interesting thing about it is, is, is even with counselors, they vary in how much self-disclosure they engage in. The, 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 you know, the highly professional ones that maintain this professional distance really come off as inhuman. So even as counselors, we have to find the finesse and the kind of balance point between self-disclosure to enter into the person's world, which creates this reciprocality that continues to, to cultivate vulnerability and being trustworthy, which, which again, it, 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 when, I, when somebody says something to me that is entirely vulnerable, I, I should take a beat or two or many before I ever respond. <clears throat> because whatever has been provided me is not a small act. It's a courageous act, so I better slow down a little bit to provide it with the gravity that ju of what just happened before me. And, and that's really quite important. Um, the last one is 
I can go it alone. I, I, I can go it alone. Now, I, I would take you back to that, um, that uh, African proverb that I mentioned to you. Um, I can go it alone. As a matter of fact, I can probably go pretty fast alone. But I, I may not be able to go very far. And so vulnerability begets more vulnerability. And courage, speaking, uh, uh, speaking from our hearts, is contagious. It tends to be. So, why? Because it, it communicates that it's safe to do this here. Now, somewhere, somehow, along the way, somebody usually jumps in. Maybe because they've had the experience to do it before, or, or because life gets so overwhelming that the only way to, have, to, to create kind of an a, a expenditure of, of pressure that's inside of them to release some of that pressure is just to say it, and to say it as it is unvarnished, unedited, just as it is. And the people that respond to that unedited stuff, that, that respond with sometimes me too, or respond with, wow, that was a really deep place that came from. I think our hearts perk up and say, oh yeah, now I think I found somebody. Um, <laughs> Job's counselors aren't one of them, just to give you a perspective. So the irony is on that is, is that, you know, I, I think in the, in the Christian context today, Job, Job would be met with very much the same kind of responses he was met with 3,000 years ago. I, I think it would be very, very similar. Um, the irony is, and again, I, I know you guys have heard me say this before, but the irony is, is that by the time we get to the end of the book, God is saying, Job represented me accurately, and you guys need to have him help you um, absolve your guilt about representing me wrong. And, and I don't think we read Job that way. You know, he, he was mad, and he was stamping his feet, and, and he was demanding an audience. And for us, we might see that as kind of a cheeky thing to do. But if it's... <laughs> My grandsons can get away with a lot of stuff, and my kids can get away with a lot of stuff. No other person can. Like walking into my room or my office and stamping their feet and saying, I need your help. Other people can't do that. And that was Job. So, you know, the, the, the key here just in terms of takeaway is, you know, the trust and vulnerability and how they interact. And the second thing is, is, why am I never enough? It, the bottom line is it's not about enough at all. <clears throat> it is about being human. It is about being a person that can value others as persons and, and invite others to, to do the same. I'm not trying to make them do the same, but it certainly is part of it. So what, what, I, wanna, uh, what I wanna launch into, and again, I think I mentioned this to you, is some of this is gonna be review. I know a lot of you guys have, have gone through the safe people stuff and boundaries. Um, but at the same time, uh, a lot of the feedback I get when I do this with people that have heard it multiple times is they always end up hearing something different. Um, so the, the, the key here is, and, and I'm gonna put this in the context of the groups that you will be entering into. Because I think generally, if I stood out here at Leprino uh, at the front door and did a poll the people that were in the, in the building as they were leaving and say, are you a safe person? My hunch is, is probably 90% more of the people, yes, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty safe. Of course, the question would be, how do we define it? And nobody can define it other than maybe keeping it confidence. But that's, that did so much more than that. And, and so, <clears throat> Um, you know, I, how we describe a safe person is, is certainly key. Well, interestingly enough, we get a little bit of an idea what it is when we look at people that are in relationship trouble. Because they give us, a, they tip us off to how they see a safe person. For example, it, it just reverse some of these. A safe person would be someone who listens to me. Um, a safe person doesn't attempt to look perfect. Now, now, most of the time, I don't think any of us, when we come off as, as having it all together, I don't think we get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, you look marvelous and, and you are perfect. No, but our responses to people seem to imply that we do. 
because we always have an answer for something. So you can look at a list. The, 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 the nature of relationship troubles most of the time is because of lack of connection and where shame comes into play. Seems so distant, I feel alone, always tries to, to control me, I'm not my best self. All of these things are very much a part of people that are in relationship trouble. Now, um, contrast that with how God sees people when he has relationship troubles with them. And he's looking at, as we all know, he looks at the heart. He doesn't always look at the kind of the characteristics within the relationship itself. He looks at the heart and what's going on in it. And so he talks about them being unfaithful and far away and, and proud and perfectionistic. And, and, and ironically, proud and perfectionistic quite naturally go together. Because the more perfectionistic we are, oftentimes the more proud we are, and we don't even see our own arrogance in, 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 in acting it. Unloving, judgmental, all of that. So, <clears throat> the, the, <clears throat> the one thing that we have to start with when we're talking about safe versus unsafe people is, is this issue of judgmental, being judgmental versus being discerning. And in our culture and other places, we, we have gotten drilled with to such a degree about don't judge me, we may even have said it, that, that it, it tends to suspend our, our ability to discern what's going on or the nature of the person I'm in a relationship with. And so we don't discern anything, just in an attempt to avoid being, quote-unquote, judgmental. And there, there is a significant difference between this. Now, the, the, the one thing I, I would add in there is sometimes it doesn't, it feels the same, but it feels the same because we're feeling some measure of shame about evaluating a person or discerning their character. But when you look at how we choose relationships on outward appearance and what happens when we're actually in relationship with somebody, we get to experience the internal culture they have, the struggles that they, they have and how it impacts us. That doesn't show up in external characteristics like the list before. It shows up in the internals of the relationship that they have. So, we don't have a lot of training in discerning character. And, and we, a lot of that has been in our, in our rush to try to not be judgmental. And, and the, the, discernment, the problem in a lot of cases is that discernment can often turn into judgment. It can turn into that. But just because it can turn into it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. Uh, it, it's just really, in a lot of ways, it's a matter of what, which side of this fence do I want to err on. But trying to understand the, the people in my life and, and what role that they play. So the, the way to think about this is three big categories. Um, and and the, the, the first category would be in the form of the abandoners. And I think when, uh, you, know, the, you know, the folks that have been in grief and loss, you've heard this before. <clears throat> and I, I, in a lot of cases, for a long period of time, I, I certainly was in this category of an abandoner. I started really strong, and then slowly but surely, the closer and closer somebody got, the, the, I became more and more invisible. Because it was easier to do that than to be known, even though I claimed that I wanted to be known. So it, it begins with promises of companionship, but lead, the person ends up leaving when they're needed the most, and they oftentimes will leave a wake behind them of these kinds of relationships. <clears throat> the unfortunate part about that is that the people that they leave in the wake by abandoning them in, in, when they're needed the most is that those people that they leave behind unfortunately make the conclusion, I was abandoned because there was something wrong with me, rather than the person who abandoned me maybe even was abandoned themselves. 
But in a lot of cases, particularly at, at, at your age of life that you're in, we make grand, grand promises of relationship for the rest of our lives. I mean, what's the phrase we use, right? BFF? Forever is a long time. You know why we say that? Because we want certainty. I mean, what kind of friend would we, would we consider we have when we say, um, I'll be your friend for this season? It's like, great, bye. <laughs> but that's the reality. It is truly the reality. And we don't, we, we don't like that. Why? Again, certainty versus uncertainty. But also, sooner or later, something is staring at us in the face, which is forced upon you in the grief and loss class, and that is loss. And we, we don't like that. So abandoners oftentimes impact the other people by destroying their trust in the future of other people. And, and the promises are, I, you know, I, I get, I'll give you a really good example, and I, I had this happen and, and I made the same mistake, even sometimes as a counselor, because you have people that are very, very wounded and need somebody to be there for them. And as a counselor, you have no resources to do that. And yet, you know, you have, oftentimes you can have people that will say, um, you know, will we always be connected? Will, we, will, we, will you always be there? And, and that request or that question is, impossible to answer because I, I don't control the future I don't know that but unfortunately because our heart breaks for the person who's asking us we end up saying oh yeah yeah for sure I'll, I'll always be here and then something happens and it breaks and what do we do we destroy their trust in the next relationship of somebody who's important to them and so trying to find a way to say things in a truthful sort of way and sometimes it's not even answering the question. It's saying, I can't answer that. And it's hard to hear, but being truthful is, is in that sense, certainly is important. The, um, the second group of people <laughs> is the critics. And the, and the critics take a parental role with people they feel compelled to correct people or to say things to them to make sure that they do it right the next time. And so they, they champion the truth, but there ain't no love in it. Um, and, and the worst part about love that is empty of truth is it's experienced like a weapon. <clears throat> so there, there's no room for grace or forgiveness and they are, they are ultimately more concerned with con confronting errors than they are with making connections. Because making a connection usually is contained in, in two words that you've heard me say two or three times already today, and that is me too. I get it. I, I understand. I've made that mistake as well. <clears throat> so they confuse weakness with sinfulness and condemn others when they have problems. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that in most cases, people that lapse, in, and there, there is, there, and I don't think I need to remind you, but I'll say it anyway. There is no one person is only one of these. We are various styles in various relationships. Sometimes we're more one in a romantic relationship than we are in a friend relationship or a more platonic one. Or, a, you know, just an acquaintance relationship. So there's nobody that's one of these ever in any way. But there are ones that we seem to be more, <laughs> have affinity with to do that. And, and the, the, the critics, unfortunately, in a lot of cases... I think Christians lapse into being critics, and they're about confronting errors rather than making connections. Yeah, Matt. Can you explain more the difference between weakness and sinfulness? Well, the 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 idea, the it's kind of a post, uh, a positional thing. 
because, you know, you've heard me say, and I've said it before, it sucks to be human, right? <laughs> and that's a weakness. So is it part of our brokenness in the theological sense of sinfulness? Yeah. But the, the, the person here attacks the sinfulness rather than part of the humanity. And I don't have to lose my humanity to, to um, and connect with somebody or ask them to be less human somehow. So they, they generally will see, they'll, they'll, they'll see sinfulness everywhere. And am I purposeful in, um, uh, you know, over, uh, over evaluating my resources and making a promise that, that I shouldn't because I, I don't have the time to do it? Is that sinful? Well, again, globally, yeah, that's part of our, our brokenness that's part of that. But it, it is our humanness that is coming into play, our human weakness that's coming into play. And so it really has more to do, that statement um, it has more to do with how do they connect. And they, they don't connect, they correct. And, and so it's, it's a sin issue rather than part of being human and weakness issue as well. So it's, not, it's an either or, not a both and in those. Okay. Um, um, I'll, I, I'll put this one up. We're running out of time. Um, I'll put this one up, and then and then we'll we'll talk some more about it next time. Um, the last group of people are the irresponsibles, and the irresponsibles are a blast to be around. They are fun. They are good time Charlies. They are all in. They they don't take care of themselves or others. They they uh, um, <laughs> love you know, the uh, gratifying instant things. They're the person in the group when. You, you feel like, ah, I feel like just, you know, eating a gallon of ice cream. And they say, do it. <laughs> and they just don't consider the consequences of their actions. And, and they do that with other people. They encourage other people to do that as well. So <clears throat> um, a lot of times, depending on our propensities, we oftentimes will be drawn to irresponsibles. <laughs> And, and if we are, you know, it's kind of like the Messiah complex or Savior complex or whatever, so you're going to try to fix this person and bring them along. But there is a certain um, number or uh, sets of behaviors that we tend to do with if we're drawn to irresponsible, like making excuses for them or nagging them or picking up after them or... or um, uh, kind of covering over the consequences of their impulsiveness. They're, all of those things are, are very much a part of our tendencies toward um, being drawn to irresponsibles. They almost invite, because of their irresponsibility, they almost invite people to take care of them. Hence the word irresponsibles. So, um, <clears throat> and those, again, like I said, those three groups of people, um, uh, are, it's a profile and there's an intermixture of these, okay? And, and so we may be a safe person in one environment, uh, in one relationship, and we may be a critic in another one and catch ourselves doing that. And that's entirely possible for that to happen. There's nobody that's uniformly one of them, okay? All right, I'm going to stop. Any questions? I'll turn the fire hose off and let you recover and breathe. And I will uh, see you all next week. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>